This is the second in a series of three lectures on quantitative genetics. Um, here what we're going to do is begin to talk about how we can actually predict evolution uh, using quantitative genetic understanding. Okay, so we know that most traits don't fall into distinct categories. How do we actually go about understanding how those uh, traits are going to evolve, uh, especially uh, when we don't necessarily know what the exact genes are that are controlling the traits. This raises kind of a conundrum for us because the genes, by definition, fall into discrete combinations of genotypes. And so how do we get something that falls into discrete combinations to give us continuously varying traits or values of a trait? Let's take a look at this. Let's look at a really simple case just to start with. Um, here we're going to look at two loci, and each locus is going to have two alleles. So we have loci uh, A and B, and within A we have alleles big A and little a, and within B we have big B and little b. And for the moment, let's just assume that all of these alleles are at equal frequency. So 50-50 uh, for big A, little a, 50-50 for big B, little b. Okay. Let's also specify that something that has all little or lowercase letter uh, alleles, so a, little a, little a, little b, little b, produces the smallest possible individual, and we'll say that that individual is going to be six centimeters in size. Then for every capital letter A, that in the genotype, that's going to increase the size of the individual by two, and for every capital B, in the genotype will increase the size by one centimeter. So here's an example where we have big A, big A, little b, little b. So this starts out at six centimeters, but because it has two big A alleles, that's going to add another four centimeters to its size. So the individual is actually going to end up being 10 centimeters, individual that has this genotype. Okay, and here's a Punnett square for two loci of all the possible genotypes in the population. And you can go through at your leisure and confirm that these are correct. And what I've done here is shown how big each one of those individuals are going to be. So if we have all uh, uppercase type of alleles, that individual will be size 12. Uh, if we have all lowercase, there'll be some that are size 6. And then there'll be several combinations to produce other things. So there are two ways to get individuals of 11 centimeters, three ways to get individuals of 10 centimeters, uh, four ways to get individuals of 9 centimeters, uh, and then three ways to get 8 and two to get 7. And so what we can do then is show a frequency distribution of the uh, number of genotypes that produce the different sizes. And that's what we see here, sizes 6 through 12 uh, with one of 6 and 12 and so forth for the other ones. So you can see we're still falling into discrete groups, but it's beginning to look more like a continuous distribution. As we increase the number of loci involved, we can very quickly increase the number of combinations of values that you could take on. So with one locus, we know that there are three genotypes. With two loci, there are nine unique genotypes. With five loci, we're up to 243 different genotypes. And with a merely 10 loci, we're now up to almost 60,000 different combinations of genotypes in the population. So you can get some, a lot of different possibilities that will begin to look very continuous after a while. Okay, so if we have lots of loci with at least two alleles affecting a trait, and then you also have the influence of the environment which can affect the trait, you can easily then end up with a trait that's going to vary continuously. That, that is a trait that could take on pretty much uh, any value within some range. Okay, now how are we going to use this information to understand the evolution and genetics of a quantitative trait? Well, let's start at the individual level. For an individual, a quantitative trait is going to have two components, the genetic component and the environmental component. And the way that we usually write this is the following. We talk about the actual value of the trait as being P, P standing for the phenotype. And then the phenotype is broken up into the genetic component of the trait, that is the genetics that contribute to whatever the value the trait has. And then E, the environmental component of the trait. 
and we write a very simple equation that the phenotype is equal to the genotypic uh, component plus the environmental component. Now let's take a look at an example of this um, in, uh, in the case of uh, three varieties of wheat. Uh, and this just showing you a picture here of some different varieties of wheat, showing that there is quite a bit of variation uh, amongst wheat varieties. The th uh, three varieties we're looking at here are Rough Rider, Seward, and Agassiz. Um, and each variety itself is genetically uniform, but it's different from the other varieties. So all the individuals in Rough Rider are exactly the same, but they're different from Seward, for example. Okay, now if you want to know what variation is purely environmental, look within a variety. So they planted out these varieties over a 10-year period, and from year to year there was variation in the environment, the amount of rain, the nutrients, and so forth, temperatures. And so, for example, let's look here at Rough Rider. Under the worst case conditions that it was grown under those 10 years, it didn't produce any uh, wheat at all, harvestable wheat. And it produced up to 63 kilos of wheat per acre. Okay, And this variation is purely due to the environment because in every year we had the exact same genes in Rough Rider. And so all the differences that we're seeing have to be due to environmental changes from year to year. Now, if we look between the varieties, when grown under common conditions, so say during the same year, then that difference is genetic. So for example, let's say that this min these minimum values here were all during the same year. We can see that under the worst conditions, all of these, no matter what their genotype, will end up producing nothing. But under the best conditions, they produce different amounts of wheat, and that's due to differences in their genetics. All right, now what we need to do is stop thinking about individuals and think about populations, because as we've discussed before, evolution occurs to populations, not individuals. So how do we take this knowledge about individuals and, and think about it for populations? What we're going to do is think about the amount of variance in the trait. Now, variance is a technical term used in statistics. Some of you may have already heard about it or even know what the formula is for it. I'm not really concerned about that here. I just want you to see and get an intuitive feel for it. So we've got two different bell curves here, one with a solid line that's broad and one with a dotted line that's fairly narrow. Note that they both have the same mean, but the spread around that mean is different for the two of them. And the solid line one is going to have a larger variance than the dotted line one because the different values are spread more widely around that mean than they are for that uh, dotted line one. So we're really concerned with variance of the trait. What we do then is we take our equation P equals G plus E and turn that into an equation about the population variance. So we have the variance seen of the phenotype, and we could get this by simply going in and measuring uh, some trait. So if we measured the height of all the individuals in our class, and then calculated the variance of that, that would give us V sub P, the variance of the phenotype. And the underlying variance of the phenotype has three components. It has the variance, the, uh, the part of the variance that's due to the genetics, the part of the variance that's due to the environment, and then this new term over here that's what we call an interaction term, that is the genotype by environment uh, interaction. So if you remember, we saw that the genotypes for the wheat varied in terms of their productivity depending on the environment. And that's what this would be, that genotype by environment interaction. And we can look at that now and we can say, okay, there are these different values here for the size of those individuals in our little example that we gave earlier. And these differences that we see here are going to be V sub G. This is the variance due to the genotype. Now, what we would probably really see in the population, because there would be an effect of the environment, would be a more continuous distribution. And what we would have to do is break out the part of their sizes that was actually due to their genetics and the part of their sizes that was actually due to the environment. 